Greetings ladies and gentlemen and welcome to the Thrones of Decay prediction video which will be the new upcoming DLC for Total War Warhammer 3 and just before we dive headfirst into that if you do enjoy the videos on the channel please do consider joining or subscribing or even just dropping a like any little bit helps the channel got some exclusive content for our members already in the member section including our ongoing Malice Darkblade series and we are revisiting the old retro game Shadow of the Horned Rat. Now that's out the way, let's talk about future DLC. Old hands will know I did a very long look at uh, all the potential future DLCs for each race in a very long video about a year and a half ago. If you haven't seen that video, um, do check it out. It'll be popping up in the top right hand corner now or you'll find the link down in the description below. And you never know, it might be a fun watch after you've watched this video. As I said, that video did come out a while ago and a lot has changed since then. Not least of which is the fact that Creative Assembly have set themselves on fire, releasing shadows of change and Pharaoh trying to fleece the Total War community, blaming rising costs and releasing statements threatening their customer base, while in reality it seemed they were trying to get us to pay for their ill-fated jaunt into the life service space that they pursued out of greed and ended in catastrophe. The Total War community hit back at a very underdeveloped DLC that was very much a gouging of the very loyal fan base that is the Total War community. I have a whole bunch more to say on this. Um, if you guys like to see my video on what went down, um, what CA's strategy has been over the last few years and what I think about it, do drop it in the comments. But that's not what we're focusing on today. Today, we are trying to look into the future. And because of the fallout of the last DLC, we have a very clear layout of what the next DLC is going to look like. And that allows us to hone in with more precision on what we might be able to expect. So now we know in Thrones of Decay, we will get three legendary lords, each playable in the Realms of Chaos and Immortal Empire campaigns for each of the three races. We know those races are the Empire, Nurgle, and Dwarves in the upcoming DLC. Each one will get new mechanics. We'll have to wait and see how good that is. We'll also get three legendary heroes, one per race, three generic lords, one per race, three generic heroes, one per race, and five units per race. Three regiments of renown and one free LC character. That was Hellbrass in Shadows of Change. But in Thrones of Decay, they say it's going to be a legendary lord. They also throw in potential further content, new spell lord, new mounts, new additional free DLC. The potential for this extra free DLC gives us some flexibility when trying to predict what they're going to put into the Thrones of Decay package. But I want to go back to the free DLC Legendary Lord, as they say we'll be getting in Thrones of Decay. Now this does conflict a little bit with an earlier release from Thrones of Decay, where they say the free DLC is going to be a free Legendary Hero. Another Legendary Hero joins the toolbox. No hints on this one, you already have all the clues you need. This is a very clear hint at a couple of characters we're going to discuss coming up but it's whether Creative Assembly changed their mind or took the same character who was meant to be a legendary hero and just upgraded him to a legendary lord, or in the new thing, it might just even be a typo. Who's to say at this point? I think what they may have done is kept it vaguely the same, but we'll get to that when we discuss the potential heroes in each individual faction. It's just something I want you guys to keep in the back of your head for now, that they did give this hint about um, them joining your toolbox. So just remember that as we go along and discuss the different factions. One more thing to mention before we delve into what we can expect from each faction is to mention the Tamakan, the Throne of Chaos book. Being heavily hinted at that this is what they'll be basing this DLC on. It's been expected ever since they announced Total War Warhammer 3. The thing is, with this book, it tells the story of a champion of Nurgle who ventures throughout the Warhammer world, starts in the north by Zan Bai Jin, which has been covered in the Total War Warhammer 3 game already with the Champions of Chaos DLC. He goes down from Zan Bai Jin, he marches east, he swings by picking up Norsken hordes, Beastmen hordes, skirts by Cafe, hits the Mountains of Morn, goes into the Darklands, picks up some Chaos Dwarves to go through to burn the city of Nullen. 
This was his basic mission. It encapsulates a lot of the areas that were going to be covered in Total War Warhammer 3, and so people have been expecting a DLC based on this pretty famous campaign book from Forge Worlds for a while. The factions in this are, of course, Nurgle, the Empire, and the Dwarves. Originally in this book, of course, it was the Chaos Dwarves, so they seem to have swapped out that faction to do the Chaos Dwarves as their own individual race pack. So a lot of the stuff we're going to be talking about I'm going to look at from the angle of coming from this book. As Creative Assembly tend to do, they try to start with the 8th edition of the Warhammer Fantasy game, and they try to build out from there. We're picking up some stuff on the fringes, um, as they've been known to do from time to time. But they usually try and start from there, and I think for this DLC, uh, most of their decisions will be starting from the Tamakan book. Not all of them, but a lot of them, and that will really help to guide us in terms of what to expect from the units, the heroes, the lords, um, etc. So just bear that in mind, when I bring up the Tamakan book, this is what I'm referring to and why I will maybe prioritize units from this book over other units that might be missing from the roster. And in this video, we're not gonna go through every single missing unit, that's not the purpose. We're really gonna try and focus in on what Creative Assembly are most likely to put into this DLC. So without further ado, let's jump in and cover the Empire. And let's start with the Lords. There's one standout character that is probably going to be the Legendary Lord for this DLC. And I've just done a lore video on her. Do check it out if you haven't already. But that is Elspeth Von Draken. You can find a link to the video popping up in the top right hand corner now. Or you'll find a link down in the description below. But Elspeth is basically an independent operator. Perhaps the most powerful user of the Wind of Shaish, the Wind of Death that there is within the Empire. She plays a crucial role in the tale of Tamakan and would be the first female legendary lord for the Empire. And along with Balthazar Gelt, one of only two magic using legendary lords they would have at their disposal. And so with the Tamakan fitting in, her uniqueness, I really think she is the front runner. There are some other candidates. They are missing Kurt Helborg, the Reichsmarschall, basically the leader of Karl Franz's armies. He's not in the game yet, but he might make an appearance later on. They're missing characters like Bolton, a man thought to be Sigmar himself resurrected, and of course all of the elect accounts. But because of the way that this is tracked to the DLC and what a unique kind of character Elspeth is in the ranks of the Empire, I think they're going to stick with Elspeth von Draken, and we'll see her making an appearance as she was the one who spearheaded and planned the, the defense of Nullen in the Tamakan book. So I think she's very likely to make an appearance as the Legendary Lord. In terms of the generic Lord for the Empire, this one's an easy one. There's a glaring hole in the Empire roster, and that is Wizard Lords. We haven't had them for the Empire yet. We should get them. They're going to make an appearance in this DLC. It would be really weird if they weren't, and it makes a thematic match for Elspeth. Sorcerer leading the way for sorcerers to become leaders of armies. That kind of makes sense in the way that CA tends to think about these things. So it'll be Lord Wizards. I'd be very surprised if it wasn't. Moving on to heroes. In terms of legendary heroes, that's a bit of a tricky one. So let's do the easy one first, and that's the generic hero. And the generic hero here is most likely to be the Master Engineers. Nullen, of course, has the Imperial Gunnery School, so Engineers would be coming out of there. And of course, Nullen is the city at the center, or at least makes the finale of the Tamakan book. So it's very fitting that we're likely to get Nullen Engineers. Another missing generic hero is the Wizards of the Lore of Metal. And we haven't had them yet, but I think they're likely to make an appearance as a free DLC to the game because it would be a bit of a jip to use an entire hero slot on wizards that really should be in the game already. The only reason they wouldn't be in the game is you were maybe holding them for this very specific DLC down the line. So that doesn't really make a lot of sense to me. So I think it's going to be the Master Engineers. Now moving on to the trickier question, the Legendary Hero. The reason this is a tricky question is because there are a number of pretty good candidates to become the legendary hero for the Empire. The first one I want to talk about is a character by the name of Jubal Falk. Jubal is basically going to maybe one day be the headmaster 
of the Imperial Gunnery School. He's a very well-regarded engineer. He carries a Hockland long rifle, and he leads a group of handgunners known as the Ironsides. Now, in the tale of Tamakan, really the only thing that distinguishes um, Ironsides from normal Empire handgunners, uh, they have full play armor. And that's the idea that they are apprentices in the Imperial Gunnery School from very wealthy families, and their families can afford to get them the better gear. Now, I would argue that Creative Assembly aren't necessarily going to stick with them just being handgunners and might make them the regiment of renown for a unit of basically Hockland long guns, basically snipers of the Empire. The reason I think this would be is because I think that's a much more interesting unit, and although it's not necessarily a unit, there was never a sort of full unit of Hockland long rifles in the Empire Army list. It's something that Creative Assembly can stretch the truth of, but still plays well and would be an interesting unit for the Empire to have in terms of a bit more long-range handgunners, um, maybe with a slower rate of fire. That could be an interesting option for them to explore, in which case Jubal Fork fits in really nice with the theming of the engineers, if they're the generic hero, and he'll be the special engineer. That fits rather nicely. The second option is Theodore Bruckner. Theodore Bruckner is basically, if you guys have watched Game of Thrones, there's a very similar line here to him basically being the mountain. He's the mountain to the Countess of Nullen, Countess Emmanuel von Leibovitz, and she has this guy who no one really knows where he comes from. He has this obscene amount of strength. He's massive. He's known to have broken a man's back with his bare hands. He's just this absolute monster who rides upon a demigriff known as Reaper. And he plays a key role in the Tamakan saga, and so would make a great melee lord with an interesting mount to play with as the Empire, which also makes him a pretty valid choice. There's another hero mentioned in the Tamakan book who is Edvard van der Kral, who is a leader of a mercenary band of swordsmen, but I don't think he's going to be included, so I'm not going to go into him much at all, but it's maybe worth keeping him in the back of your heads. But the third option I think that's actually valid is Ludwig Schwarzhelm. Now, Ludwig is the Emperor's champion, his standard bearer. He'd be a massive fighter and give huge buffs to the army when carrying the standard of the Emperor. The issue here is that he isn't really mentioned in the Tanakan book at all, but I also don't see where he could fit in. I think there's an argument to be made that there could be a final DLC for the Empire, one more, focused around Middenheim, and that's when you get in characters like Volton and Lufa Huss. We'll talk about that a bit more when we get into the five units that I think will be up in the DLC. But there's a huge opportunity for that, and I don't think Ludwig Schwarzhelm fits in that. And if you don't put him in the final one, then how are you getting him in? And he's a huge character in the Warhammer lore, and so I think they might take the opportunity to put him in this. So we have three very good choices that would all make sense in this DLC. Which way are they going to go? For me, it's a bit of a flip of a coin, but I think for recognizability, I think they go for Schwarzhelm. So that would be my pick for this DLC. This is one of the choices I'm most unsure about, so take it with a pinch of salt. But I don't think he fits in anywhere else, really, and you can't not have him in the game. So I think he slots into this DLC, and he, instead of being the Theodore Bruckner, who's the champion of the Countess, he is the champion of the Emperor, and maybe they give him a demigriff mount just to make things a bit more interesting. Who knows? So I think that's the way they're going to go, but I could be I could be very wrong on this one, and they could go uh, with either of the other two options, but I think it's definitely going to be one of those three. In terms of units, let's go to the first one, and I think that will be the Celestial Hurricanum. This is an iconic unit, not necessarily a standout unit from the Tamakan book, but a glaring hole in the roster of the Empire as it stands. What is the Celestial Hurricanum, I hear you say, for those of you who are perhaps unfamiliar? Well, it's a bit of kit that boosts magic around it, but also basically has a bunch of bound spells that you'd be able to use. The idea is that there are celestial wizards on this contraption, and it gathers together the winds of celestial magic, which come to be known as the Storm of Shemtek. And when they built up enough energy, they unleash the magic in a direction towards the enemy. Now, on the tabletop, this would take the form bound spells. The spells it could do on the tabletop were decided by the roll of a dice. 
If you rolled a 1, it was a sun downpour, it would rain a bit, but no damage is done to the enemy. 2, you'd get an Ice Shard Tempest, which I imagine they'll just use something like the uh, Hail Magic spell from the Kislev Lore of Tempest. And 3 was Raging Tornado. They do technically have the ability to do a little tornado. If you guys have fiddled around with the extra bit they did for the Intel promotion, I can't remember, the name's escaping me now, but there's a big spell on there that's a massive tornado. But I don't, they might shrink that one down a bit and make it playable in the actual campaign, which would be a cool little spell to have. There was um, a lightning strike on a 4 or a 5, and on 6 it was the meteor strike, and we know that that's already a spell in the game. And so maybe it'll just be a contraption that adds to your power. On the tabletop it was plus 1 dice to your power pool. Don't know how that'll take shape in Total War Warhammer. But it'll boost magic, and it'll maybe have several, or if not all, of those bound spells attached to it as well. In terms of theming, it fits quite nicely as well, with um, Elspeth being a magic-using legendary lord, and with the lord wizards coming in as the generic lords as well, to have the Celestial Hurricanum joining them, it fits quite nicely. So a fun little bit of kit that could make a great addition to the Empire. The next one that does play a role in the Tamakan book, and that is the Marienburg land ships. Now, the idea is that this is before Marienburg got their hand on these land ships. Marienburg, of course, bought its independence many years ago, but now it's looking with envy at the Empire steam tanks. Sometimes they used to loan them out at a very expensive cost, and Marienburg were like, hey, we should get our own steam tanks. Now, the engineering school in Old Dorf, where the steam tanks were made, were like, no, this is a state secret. We're not going to tell you how to build these yourself. Get lost. So they traipsed along to perhaps the gold hungrier Nullen school and, you know, gave, had a word with the Countess Isabella. And she was like, you know what? Yeah, we'll take your money. But the problem was they actually don't know how to build steam tanks in Nullen, but they have ingenuity and they could never get the boiler down to the size it is in the steam tanks from Altdorf, but they could make a really big one. And so they themed it around the idea of this huge ship and it's less reliable, but it's big. It can have men on board firing its rifles. It has a smaller cannon because a bigger cannon would blow the thing apart. They found in their experimentation. But at the time of the story of Tamakan, they were still constructing these in Nullen, and the Countess pressed them into service to help fight off the horde of Tamakan. And so you could argue, although they are meant to be a Marienburg unit, they can be Nullen based as well because that's where they're being constructed. So that's a fun little unit and one that's been sort of on the people's wish list since Total War Warhammer 1 and it'd be great to see it in the game. So I'm super looking forward to hopefully getting the land battleships in Total War Warhammer 3. It'll be a great addition. Next up we have a subject I touched on briefly earlier and that is the idea of a unit of Hockland Long Rifles. I talked about Jubal Folk and his regiment maybe being um, a regiment renowned of these guys. So I think, as I said earlier, it's not necessarily a missing unit, as they've never really had regiments of long rifles, but I think it could be a unit that would be added in this DLC and then make a nice change rather than just um, the Iron Cider template, which would just be handgunners with extra armor. That's not really adding much that's very interesting, but you throw in a unit of Imperial Snipers in there, that's a pretty interesting unit to be able to, for us to get our hands on. So hopefully that's what I think we're going to get as our third unit. The fourth, I think, is going to be knights of some sort. Now, there are two big choices here, two big knightly orders that aren't in the game and are bigger than some of the knightly orders they've already put in the game, and that is the Knights of the White Wolf and the Knights Panther. I don't think we're going to get both because I think that Creative Assembly are holding, as I mentioned earlier, one more Empire DLC back to get in a Middenheim-based one, They'll finally make Boris Toddbringer playable after all this time since the first DLC they ever released for Total War Warhammer 1. They will add the Knights of the White Wolf, the Teutonic Guard, which are basically Knights of the White Wolf on foot. Maybe some other Middenheim, the Priests of Ulrich, um, stuff like that. A really Middenheim-themed DLC pack is still available to be put into Total War Warhammer of the units left that the Empire is really uh, missing in any degree from their roster list. So I think it'll be Knight's Panther. 
And so the Knight's Panther are known as being this very anti-chaos, anti-monster, anti-mutant knight's order. And so they fit quite nicely into what they're going up against in Total War Warhammer 3. So I think we'll get the Knight's Panther, who are known for having made their name in the Crusades against Araby a long time ago. And from there, they brought back Panthers. They used their skins to decorate their armor, their horse saddles. That's still a tradition they continue forward. They used to have uh, Panthers on their helmets, but they have since been replaced by icons of Beastmen, who they love to hunt. So, you know, we might make these guys an actual anti-large cavalry, apart from the demigriffs with halberds that we have already for the Empire, to maybe bolster their forces in terms of what they can do versus large opponents. But that's just an idea off the top of my head. I think it will be Knight's Panther going into this DLC that we'll get as the Knightly Order added. And in the fifth spot, a bit controversial, but I'm just hoping, and I think it's more wishful thinking than anything else, but let's get the hot pot in the game. In the latest little bit of news released from Creative Assembly when they were telling us about the up and coming changes to the Shadows of Change DLC when they were adding units, this little bit of information came out where they're looking forward to adding in more units, especially, yes, I'm looking at you, hot pot. Yes, I'm looking at you. If not this, with what looks like the second to last Empire DLC, then when? Unless they do an actual halfling race pack, which would be great, but I just don't see Creative Assembly doing this. I'm not going to get my hopes up for a halfling race pack, so at least just give us the hot pot in this one. It kind of fits in with Nullen under siege. They're just having to makeshift, and maybe some local halflings are maybe ready with a pot full of boiling, dissolving liquid to fire at the horde of Tamakan. So let's get the hot pot in the game. That's what I'm hoping for. If it's not the hot pot and it's not maybe just throwing in the Knights of the White Wolf, maybe it'll be something like Hunting Dogs, which will be very much less impressive. It'll just be a reskin of all the dog units we have in the game already. And maybe that's minimally what we'll get. And that'll just be it. No hot pot yet. Maybe that'll be coming down the line with something else. But it'll be weird to fit them in elsewhere unless you do as I said, that halfling race pack. The last thing I want to mention is the Imperial Dragon. Karl Franz is known to sometimes go to the Imperial Zoo, get the Imperial Dragon out, and ride it into battle. This, if you're going to give Katrina her sled, give Karl Franz the Imperial Dragon. And I think that might be thrown in as a free DLC, as they're going to have to make a Carmine Dragon for Elspeth, as it is, if they don't want to base it exactly on the Orph 1 Dragons. The tweaks to that might carry through, and we might get a Dragon Mount for Karl Franz as a free DLC. So, fingers crossed for that. So, laying our cards on the table, this is what I think the Thrones of Decay Empire roster will look like. Legendary Lord Elspeth. Generic Lord, the Wizard Lords. Legendary Hero, Ludwig Schwarzhelm. Generic Hero, Master Engineers. The units, Celestial Hurricanum, Land Ships, Hockland Long Rifles, Knight's Panther, and the Hot Pot, with free DLC of the Wizards of the Gold Order or Metal Wizards, and Karl Franz's Imperial Dragon Mount. That's what I think the Empire will shape up like. Let's move on to Nurgle. Now, looking at Nurgle Lords, of course, for the legendary Lord, the man who the book was named after, we're going to get Tamakan. Now, in reality, Tamakan is actually this massive maggot-like worm creature that infects hosts, kill them, and then just uses their bodies as big puppets. He starts the story in the body of a Chaos Champion, ends up in the body of an Ogre Tyrant. I don't think they... they might... I don't think they're gonna play around with the mechanic match. I think they're gonna basically just put him in the body of an Ogre Tyrant. They might try and make it so he can change hosts. I think that'd be really weird and i can't imagine how they're going to do that with the mechanics available to them unless they really push the boat out so i think what we're basically going to get is him on the tyrant form on top of his toad dragon and they're going to just leave it at that it's pretty obvious he's going to be legendary lord there's maybe an outside chance it could be epidemius who is the tally man for nurgle who keeps a record of all his diseases but we're going to talk about him a little bit later in the heroes section because um, i think that's probably more likely where he's going to appear in terms of the generic lord for nurgle i think it's not going to be much um, excitement here it's just going to be a melee focused lord 
for Nurgle that can fight. We don't have them. I think they have the Sorcerer Lord at the moment, but I think they're going to fill in the gap there. In terms of heroes, there are a number of heroes that were mentioned in the tale of Tamakan. There was Sal the Faithless, who was basically his number two for all of those members in his horde who weren't necessarily Nurgle supporters. They went to him for advice. He did a lot of stuff in the tale of Tamakan. There was Kaizik the Befouled, which was the leader of the Rot Knights who rode around on these Rot Beasts. And that we might talk about a little bit more when it comes to the units. And there was Orbal Vipergut, who was a dragon riding ogre, Chaos Ogre, which could be a really interesting addition in terms of heroes as well. And of course, there's also the option to have Epidemius be the hero. He is probably the most well-known of the Nurgle champions. As I said, Epidemius was Nurgle's tally man. He'd keep track of all of Nurgle's diseases. And in the tabletop, he played very interestingly, which could translate in quite a fun way in Total War Warhammer. He would have this effect where any wounds caused by Nurgle demons, whether by magic or in melee, he'd tally up. And then as he tallied them up, he would give a buff to all the Nurgle demons within the army. So if they'd done 7 plus wounds in total, they'd all get plus 1 strength, 14 plus all plus 1 toughness, 21 upwards, they'd all get killing blow, and then when they hit 28, they got to re-roll their ward saves. So you could have this map-wide effect for Epidemius, where as the wounds that Nurgle units total up, it wouldn't be dissimilar to the Dark Elf mechanic, but with increasing levels that stayed permanent as the battle went on. So he could make quite a compelling character with a really interesting mechanic. Sal the Faithless is more of a Chaos Undivided character rather than Nurgle focused, so I think they might throw him aside. Viper Gut also maybe you could argue is a bit more Chaos Undivided and so maybe rules himself out there. So we come between the Befouled and maybe Epidemius. With the Shadow of Change, and with Total War Warhammer 3 being very chaos focused, they gave the free legendary hero to Zinch. Now, I'm tempted to say they're going to give the free legendary hero to Nurgle, in which case I'm pretty sure that free legendary, well, they say for a Thrones of Decay will be a legendary lord, that free legendary lord would be Epidemius. But if you guys remember at the beginning, I mentioned the old release where they said it was going to be um, watch out for your toolbox or whatever it was. That very much hints at uh, engineering maybe, and that hints more at maybe a dwarven character rather than Epidemius. So I'm a bit in two minds about this one, whether they make it one of these other characters or Epidemius is the hero. I'll put it this way. If the free legendary lord is Nurgle, it will be Epidemius. If it's not, Epidemius will be the hero. And for reasons I'll go into when we hit the dwarf section, I think the legendary lord might be a dwarf. That would make Epidemius having to fill in the whole of the hero, which takes the befouled and perhaps even the rot knights out of contention. But we'll get to that in just a moment. Let's first cover who we think the generic hero will be. And, you know, it'd be, fun, it'd be fun to get something like the Sloppity Bile Piper or something like that. But I think they're going to keep it simple and give us a Nurgle Sorcerer Hero. Um, we have the Sorcerer Lord and the Melee Hero. We're just going to get them filling in the rest of the gaps in terms of the Nurgle Warriors of Chaos roster there. And we're going to get the Sorcerer Hero. Let's move on to units. First up are Bile Trolls. These guys featured in the Tamikan book. They are b trolls that have been blessed by Nurgle, just horrific monstrosities. They're likely to make an appearance. The only question really is, will we be getting other Mark trolls by the other gods of Chaos? That could be an option. Don't know if Creative Assembly will go or push the boat that far out. We might just get the Bile Trolls. We'll also get the Siege Giants. These are giants that Tamakan picked up. And then when he allied with the Chaos Dwarves, they strapped metal armor plates to the Chaos Siege Giants, and they went storming into battle, trying to tear down walls. And even if they got killed on a wall, the idea was that the army could still climb up their backs and get onto their enemies' battlements. But these were horrible monstrosities, and again, like the trolls, might lead us to get an option to get other Mark Giants. Funnily enough, with the Regiment of Renown, we kind of have a Nurgle-blessed giant, 
So we might get generic forms of that and the other ones, but they might save them for other DLC packs, and all we get is a Chaos Siege Giant, which I think would also be added to the Chaos Dwarf roster. The next unit we have that I think they'll throw in just because they've made it already will be the Feral Toad Dragon, that is Tamakan's mount. They'd have made the model. It's already there. It's a gimme. Just throw in the Toad Dragon as a Feral Toad Dragon. And that's another unit for you. We'll also get some form of Nurgle marked Beastmen. Probably carrying a great weapon. Don't know if they're going to make them in any other forms. But like in Shadows of Change. I think they were in the end with the additions. There were two forms of Zinch marked Beastmen. We'll get at least one form of Nurgle marked Beastmen in this pack, I'm sure. And, of course, the Rot Knights. We mentioned the Befouled and his Rot Knights. These guys never came out in mass-produced models. There's really only him. But they give you an idea of what Rot Beasts look like. And they might make a unit of Rot Knights as Nurgle's elite cavalry force. On the other hand, they might not. We already have the Toads and the Demons riding the Toads. So that might be enough for Nurgle. And CA might consider Rot Knights to be a cavalry unit too far. And so I think what we're going to get a cavalry unit too far. The next one is Chaos Ogres. Now Tamakan, of course, inhabits the body of an ogre. And they do spend a lot of time in the Mountains of Morn. So to have Chaos Ogres would thematically fit this pack quite well. And I really hope we don't just get an undivided ogre. It would be great to see ogres of the different gods making an appearance. But as it's a Nurgle pack, we might just see maybe some Nurgle-themed ogres or just some plain Chaos Undivided ogres that make an appearance. And last, there is an iconic unit of Nurgle that's still missing, and that is the Blight Kings. Now, the Blight Kings were very much an end times unit and merging over with um, Age of Sigmar. So Creative Assembly might avoid them. Also, they fit in quite nicely with another Nurgle Lord, which is Gutrot Spume. And there still may be some sort of naval-themed DLC with Gutrot Spume going up against the High Elves. But not sure about that one. We'll have to wait and see. So that's why I think the Blight Kings might not make an appearance in this DLC. So let's sum up with my final thoughts on Nurgle's roster for the Thrones of Decay. I think for the Legendary Lord, we're going to get Tamakan. For the Generic Lord, we're going to get some sort of Melee Lord. For the Legendary Hero, I think it's going to be Epidemius. As I said, if it's Epidemius is the free Legendary Lord, then things will be changed, particularly over in my Dwarf selections. But for now, I'm going to stick with Epidemius being the Legendary Hero and the Generic Lord being a Sorcerer Hero. The units I think we're going to get are the Bile Trolls, the Siege Giants, the Feral Toad Dragon, Marked Beastmen, and I'm going in on the Rot Knights. And the reason I'm going in on the Rot Knights is I think as a free DLC, we might get Chaos Ogres, an undivided variety, and a unit representing each of the Chaos Gods as well. And the only excuse you could have for that is maybe as a free DLC. Because why would you throw in some corn ogres with a Nurgle-based DLC? It wouldn't make a lot of sense. And this is the DLC where it makes most sense to include Chaos Ogres. It's quite a big ask for a free DLC, but that's what I'm going to gamble on as far as the Nurgle roster goes. So let's move on to the Dwarves. Now when it comes to the Lords of the Dwarves, I think there are a couple of candidates for the Legendary Lord. And that is Malachi McKayson, who fits the pack perfectly is the best thematic choice. But Malachi had a lot of adventures with Gotrek and Felix, and they might want to make Malachi, at least at first, I thought they might want to make Malachi a bit more accessible. He's a Slayer Engineer. He comes up with all sorts of crazy inventions. In the unit section, we're going to talk about the Thunder Barge and the Axe Hewer. He's responsible for inventing both of those. And if you invent two of the three units in a DLC pack, I feel they almost have to make him the Legendary Lord in the DLC pack. I think if you guys remember at the beginning of the video, I mentioned the earlier tip for a Legendary Hero. I think when they wrote that, Malachi McKayson was going to be the Legendary Hero free LC that we were going to get in that pack in the original plan. But I think with expanding out the Dwarves to have five units in it, most of which are probably going to be Slayer themed, that having Malachi as the Legendary Lord for that theme pack has to be the way to go. 
The other alternative is a young up-and-coming engineer known as Grim Berlickson. He has a whole bunch of new ideas. He's coming up with a cog axe. He is a very innovative new engineer who isn't tied to the traditions of the old dwarven way of doing things. And so he also is a very interesting character that would be a great addition to the dwarven army. But I think because of the way it's gone, they might swap out Malachi McKayson for Grim Berlickson as far as the free legendary lord goes. If it is, if they don't go the way of Nurgle and don't make the free legendary lord Epidemius, which I don't think they're going to do, I think the free legendary lord is going to be Grim Berlickson for the dwarves. And then Malachi McKayson thematically would have to lead this DLC pack for the dwarves. They might swap it around, just give Malachi as the free legendary lord, but I think the free legendary lord is going to be dwarven, because really it's chop and change which one you want to make the paid legendary lord for this pack, and which one you want to make free, but both should be included, particularly if this is going to be the final DLC the dwarves ever get, which it looks likely. Most of the roster's filled, there's not that many big gaps left to do, this is probably it as far as the dwarves go. In terms of generic heroes, I think it's going to be the demon slayer, the melee slayer dwarf leading an army. And I think that's what they're going to go for for options as far as generic lords. In terms of heroes, I am um are about this and we're going to start with the generic heroes in the case of the dwarves here as well. And I think there's two choices here. There's the Dragon Slayer, which, like the Demon Slayer, is just a rung down, a hero form of a Slayer. Now, that's a bit boring if you have both of them in the same DLC pack. It doesn't add that much more interest. So what alternatives could we have? And the best alternative I could think of is the Brewmaster. Now, the Brewmaster would introduce the concept of healing into the Dwarven Army, which I think is something they could really do well with. The Brewmasters could reinvigorate them, heal them. The brews of the dwarves have some particularly lovely effects on the dwarves who drink it. So if it is the Brewmaster, then that would make the legendary hero Joseph Bugman. Now, if Thrones of Decay was having a legendary hero for a free DLC, he'd be maybe top of the list in terms of being able to go around and help. But I think they're maybe going to keep him as a dwarf exclusive character and not let him roam around and join other armies. So I think Joseph Bugman is going to be the legendary hero, and the generic heroes are going to be the brewmasters to introduce a healer into the dwarven ranks effectively. And I think that would be a great addition. That does leave the Dragon Slayers at a bit of a loose end, and maybe they'll be thrown in as a free DLC hero with the dwarves. So with that out of the way, let's get on to the units. Now, the units would be the Thunder Barge, one of the inventions of Malachi, a big barge with cannon, all sorts of things firing out. Cafe really led the way as far as flying sort of balloons that you could fire out of. The dwarves should get a version that's a bit more deadly than the stuff they can get out of Cafe, I would imagine, and maybe a bit sturdier as well. We're also likely to get the Axe Hewer, um, a axe throwing device, again, another invention of Malachi, and it would just maybe be a bit short range, armor piercing damage, and be a handy bit of kit with some maybe rapid fire axes flying out of it. In terms of infantry, I think we might get Doom Seekers. In terms of small units, this might be a type of Slayer that I suggested in my future DLC video a long time ago that could perhaps be an anti-infantry type of slayer. They did operate individually, if I remember correctly, on the tabletop. Creative Assembly might do something like merge the concept of Doom Seekers with the concept of a slayer hero and do that as a generic hero, which could be quite interesting, or they'll just make them a very small number unit and they'll do a lot of damage, but maybe be a bit of a glass cannon unit quite fragile to, say, missile fire and things like that. That would be how the Doom Seekers would operate. And yet another Slayer unit that could be introduced in this DLC are the Slayer Pirates. As a regiment of renown for these guys, you could have Long Drong's legendary Slayer Pirates, who are the very well-known regiment of Slayer Pirates. But I think, you know, with a Slayer Engineer, a fun unit to add and to add something different to perhaps if you're trying to do a Slayer-themed army, uh, Slayers with Pistols. They could maybe fire on the move, uh, not quite a haranguing unit, they maybe wouldn't have the speed for that, but an interesting unit in terms of utility for the dwarves to have. 
So the Slayer Pirates could be a fun addition, very much on theme with what's going on and the more classically known units in the Dwarven Army that are still missing from the roster. So I think Slayer Pirates would be a really fun choice for Creative Assembly, and it struck me as a bit of a logical one, especially if you have a Slayer Engineer leading the charge. And last, but by no means least, I think Creative Assembly will throw in the Rune Guardians. Is it something I would do if I was in charge? Maybe not. They're not my favorite unit in the... Dwarven roster, but I think there's been a clamoring for them amongst the community, and so some people do want them. And it's the idea that these are rune guardians, golems animated by rune magic, that are half rune magic and half mechanical. The rune to make them, the rune of awakening, has been long lost, millennia ago. So no more of the rune guardians can be made, but there are a few about, and the dwarves may add them to their ranks in this DLC. So we'll probably see the Rune Guardians as a big signature piece for the Dwarven Army. And I think as a free DLC mount, we might also see Shield Bearers make an appearance, adding a bit more attack power and maybe speed or something like that to any Dwarven Lord. It's a very traditional way that they used to go about, and so it would be fun to get the Shield Bearers in Total War Warhammer. Let's summarize what we think we're going to get with the Dwarves. I think we're going to get Malachi McKayson as the Legendary Lord. As the Generic Lords, we're going to get Demon Slayers. For the Legendary Hero, I think we're going to get Joseph Bugman. That would be a big one. And for the Generic Hero, I think we might get Brewmasters. For units, the Thunder Barge, the Axe Hewer, the Doom Seekers, the Slayer Pirates, and the Rune Guardian. And for free DLC, maybe we might get the Dragon Slayer Heroes. But if they give us the Lords, they might skip the Dragon Slayer Heroes. I don't know. They might. If we see them, I think they'll probably be a free DLC. The Shield Bear amount, that's also a maybe. I'm not 100% sure on that one. But it would be a nice little addition if they make that for us. And Grim Burlickson. Grim Burlickson entirely dependent on the fact it won't be a Nurgle character. If it is a Nurgle character... I think they'll maybe cut Grim Burdickson and maybe we just won't see him in the game, which would be a great shame. But hopefully he's included as a free DLC Lord and we get to see him and Epidemius both make an appearance in the Thrones of Decay. And that's it for the Thrones of Decay, ladies and gentlemen. That's all three factions we've gone through. Let me know your thoughts. If you agree with me, if you don't agree with me, what other units you think we might see in this DLC. And if you've liked the video, please do drop a like, subscribe, and maybe consider joining if you can. That would be great and a huge support to the channel. Other than that, guys, as always, a huge thank you for watching, and I hope to catch you all on the next one. All right, guys? Bye.